Welcome to a surprise episode of Advent of Computing. If you're familiar with the show, then you should notice this is an off week, which traditionally around here only means one thing, an interview. I usually don't do these. I, I keep telling myself I need to do more interviews, so hey, maybe this is a sign of things to come. Anyway, last week I had the chance to sit down and talk with Aaron Reed, author of 50 Years of Text Games. It's a fantastic blog series and supposedly an upcoming book. I don't really have much preamble here besides the announcement, so I'm just going to dive right into the interview. Enjoy, and I'll see you next week with a normal episode. Well, I have with me here today Aaron Reed, who is the author of the 50 Years of Text Games blog, and he's currently working on another larger project. So, Aaron, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to my listeners? Hi, yeah, um, I'm Aaron E. Reed. I have been writing interactive fiction for probably almost 20 years now, Um, originally doing kind of uh, old school text adventure games, but then moving on to kind of more um, experimental stuff across um, augmented reality and just like all kinds of different fields. And yeah, lately I uh, have been working on this blog series that's being turned into a book about the history of computer games without graphics. It's kind of the one sentence pitch. So basically taking one game from each of the last 50 years uh, starting in 1971 when the original text version of the Oregon Trail was released, um, picking one game each year and kind of diving into, you know, how it works, what's interesting about it, the story behind it. Um, And that's turned into a really cool and interesting project. Very good. So I I think we both share an interest in computer history, to put it mildly. (laughs) Um, And you bring up a couple... Really good questions I want to talk to you about. So what's with your fascination with, as you were saying, games without graphics or text games, or should we call it interactive fiction? Yeah, it goes by a number of different names, right? Um, text games is like the term I picked for this project because I feel like it's the, it's kind of the broadest, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, I'm, I'm a writer. Uh, like ever since I was a little kid, I loved writing. And also the, the, the notion of writing being interactive, right? Being a, a story that you're reading, but you can also maybe change something about it. You can, it's asking you for your opinion about things. Uh, that was always really cool to me. So um, when I was a kid in the 80s, when the, our family got our first computer, one of the games that it came with was Adventure, kind of the original like 1970s um, text adventure that kind of spawned it's that whole best. genre. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, even though I was born technically too late to have experienced that when it first came out, I kind of got, um, I started at the beginning essentially, right? Because that was the first, um, almost the first computer game of any kind I I played. Um, And so that just kind of, uh, you know, sparked this lifelong fascination for that that whole genre. Um, And I think it's, um, it's just so interesting to me because, you know, writing, like telling stories with words is like one of our oldest human things, right? We've been doing that. Um, in print for hundreds of years and verbally for thousands of years. And the idea of then combining that with all of the sort of new interesting stuff we're figuring out how to do with computers, um, it's just such an interesting mixture of like old and new. Um, and I just love the kind of, the, all the kinds of creativity that have happened at that intersection um, over the last, you know, five decades. It seems that Adventure or Colossal Cave Adventure, right? That's the original name is also just a really good starting point, especially since it's been ported to like, every platform i remember yeah, in yeah. in high school one of my friends showed me that he had an install of it on like his old ipod touch and he's like oh <laughs> check this out yeah yeah it's been it's been ported probably to every <laughs> pretty much every <laughs> computer platform ever made right well it's such a simple program too. the actual back end of it i mean it is in fortran so it's not the most portable thing ostensibly right. <laughs> but I, I guess that also brings up another good point. I'm I'm a little jealous of your medium, Aaron. <laughs> Since I just do audio stuff, I, mm. I I do end up talking a lot about programming. And that's I have to limit myself because that's hard to get across on an audio medium, you know? Mm. So was that a consideration that was in your head when you chose to do a blog? Because I guess for people that haven't read any of your work on your 50 years of text games blog, you have code snippets that you explain for like, well, um, I think the Oregon Trail when you have one equation that I thought was cool for the difficulty curve for bandit encounters. Right, right. 
Yeah, that was definitely a consideration. You know, like I thought, you know, yeah, maybe I should make this a podcast or a video series or something because, you know, that's where a lot more people are getting content these days. But, um, but yeah, again, like as a writer, like that's sort of like what I'm inherently good at is, is um, the written word. And yeah, the, the chance to be able to do things like, let's look at some source code. Let's, um, you know, uh, look at, you know, there's, there's, I use a ton of um, interviews with authors, especially when around the time the game first came out, like what they were thinking when they were first writing it. And that's the kind of stuff where, you know, you're not going to have a video clip of it. You're not going to necessarily have audio. So um, it's uh, it's just a good way to get really in-depth in the subject. Um, and yeah, the source code stuff in particular um, was something that was important to me to do in this project because um, I think it's a really, like actually going to the source code and looking at it and saying, okay, how did this work? What was this doing? Um, it's such a good way of understanding something in a different kind of way than if it's a game, if you're just playing it or if you're just running any kind of program. Um, I was kind of inspired by uh, a guy named Mark Marino, who's been behind a movement called Software Studies in Academia, which is kind of that same idea of if you're going to write critically about software, um, you know, don't just use it, like look at how it works and understand on a deep level how it works. Um, not necessarily all of it, right? You don't have to look at every line of source code for a program to have an opinion on it. But if you can find, if the source is available and you can find a little part that kind of illustrates something about what the programmer was thinking or the context in which it was made, you're sort of understanding it on a different level than if you're just looking at the surface. That's a really good point. I know I've, I ran into a lot of um, source preservation projects that I think are really value, especially are really valuable, especially yeah, one that yeah. comes to mind in this context is Zork, all the original code for that, even though it's its own special language is preserved, which right, yeah. is really important to be able to have access to. Yep. So I guess while we're talking about preservation, what do you think are some of the success stories of preservation in this genre of text games? Since it does go back a little ways, and I know there's been some, some code that's missing. So have there been any games that you've been like excited when you've actually seen the code for? Yeah, it is. It is really interesting because, um, you know, like with any digital archival work, there's this sort of weird dichotomy of on the one hand, it's like so easy to preserve data, right? You can copy it an infinite number of times without degrading the original, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, if no one ever thought to do that preservation before it got lost, it's gone forever because it didn't leave behind any kind of physical imprint, right? So, so yeah, the, this history is just this weird mixture of stuff that's really well documented. Um, and then stuff that's just gone and it's unclear if it's ever coming back. Um, so a, a success story, I think, is... Um, so I started writing this kind of stuff, um, doing those sort of text adventure style games. Uh, uh, parser games is kind of one of the, the terms for those. And the community... Um, so I guess a little background. In the 1980s, those games were kind of the, uh, the computer game market for the first half of the 80s, especially, um, because most home computers were still bootstrapping themselves up to where they could show kind of any amount of graphics at all, right? So text adventures are sort of an easy sell. And it was something that was cool and impressive and not, you know, like four colors uh, and a jagged polygon, right? To, to impress your friends. Um, uh, after uh, graphical games kind of took over and text adventures died commercially in the 1990s, there was a group of kind of hobbyists who came and reverse engineered a bunch of the commercial story formats and started making their own games in them. Um, and that kind of spawned this whole renaissance uh, and and really developed that medium into um, a kind of unique storytelling medium moving beyond kind of what had been explored in a kind of a commercial context before. Um, so anyway, that community, which kind of got started in um, the early 90s on Usenet, um, has actually done a really extraordinary job at preserving uh, their history, preserving the history of those games, um, and making all of that um, stuff available and continuing to keep it playable. So a lot of that has been work in um, keeping software running on modern platforms, um, you know, porting things. It's been work in, you know, setting up archives. So they have a thing called the IF Archive, Interactive Fiction Archive, that's been running since the early 90s. And it's just got thousands of files, um, everything from source code to games to, um, you know, records of discussions. Um, and that stuff is just invaluable to understand the medium, um, but also to um, just kind of keep it, keep a continuity going. And I, I think there's a real difference in the kind of stuff that community has made um, compared to communities that just kind of have a shallower history and are only looking back at the last couple of years 
um, of work um, because the stuff farther back is lost or inaccessible or whatever. Um, so yeah, that community is a really interesting success story to me. And um, you know, you can go back and find the news group archives and find discussions from 1996 where people were like post by post inventing a certain concept or you know <laughs> coming up with an idea. Um, and it's that's really cool to have those records. And that's maybe different, I think, than the era we're in now, where a lot of that stuff is happening. I think in more ephemeral spaces like Discord chats or um, you know Zoom calls, <laughs> for example. Um, so. Um, So yeah, it it is, it's always been through this whole project. It's just weird balance between, you know, being able to read an exact conversation from 1993 and having no way to play like an iPhone game from 2015 anymore. Right. (laughs) It's just a a lot of weird contrast there. Talking just broadly about the history, how do you pick your start point for the blog? And is it going to be different than the book? Because I know your blog starts with Oregon Trail and that's not necessarily the first time that people started (laughs) using text for or computers really for some kind of interactive fiction or interactive game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So, so yeah, like the, the book and the series both uh, start in 1971, although the book actually has kind of a little prologue that goes back earlier. Um, but I picked that mostly because of the Oregon trail. Right. So I had heard back in 2020 um, it just sort of randomly came across my feed or something that 2021 was going to be the 50th anniversary of the first version of that game. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder, you know, maybe if there's something that could be done like to commemorate that anniversary and that kind of kicked off the seed for the project. But, um, but as I was doing the research and really getting into it, um, it actually is kind of a, uh, it was a good choice to begin this series because 1971 was really kind of the first time you started seeing like communities of um, software practitioners and game makers specifically emerge. So before that, you had individual people doing experiments here and there. Um, you know, you had things like Eliza in the '60s and um, a lot of those early um, experiments. But um, the '70s was kind of the first time that you started to see enough computer installations exist that um, there started to be things like national newsletters of computer uh, enthusiasts writing about the, the code they were doing. There started to be you know, local meetups outside of the context of like a research lab or a university computer center. Um, So when I was compiling a list of possible games to cover before 1971, it's pretty hard to find, you know, more than one or two interesting programs uh, a year, right? Like you don't have a lot to choose from. Um, 71, 72 is really when you start seeing like um, a a selection of games, right? Like a bunch of different games being made each year. Um, so I think it is, it's kind of arbitrary in a sense, and it's just tied to this one particular game, but it's, it's kind of in another way, a sensible starting place because it's the first time you really kind of start seeing this accelerating momentum. I really like that answer. And I've kind of grappled with a similar problem myself on my own show because it's, it's hard to pick out first, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And anytime you claim that something happened first, you're, you're, you're possibly wrong. <laughs> there was probably someone else who did it earlier and who just isn't as famous or has some caveat attached to it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was definitely something across the series where there were a lot of times, you know, I'd discover something, I'd be like, oh, I think this was the first time, you know, X happened. But I really had to learn to catch myself because I would almost always be wrong. <laughs> yeah, you gotta <laughs> be careful. Was some earlier I, precedent. I like to usually say that, oh, this was the first X that was actually public and actually used by other people <laughs> right yeah, because yeah. otherwise you get into weird situations like the the first mouse that was actually copied and used was made by Engelbart in the 60s but prior to that there was another mouse that was very similar that was made under a government contract that no one saw out of the labs so was like well yeah <laughs> technically that's the first but <laughs> yeah how does it actually matter in the grand scheme of things for decades yeah, I, I went down an interesting research rabbit hole for this prologue section, trying to figure out, well, when was the first time that people could type text into a computer? That's and a I tough ass- one. <laughs> yeah, and I assumed it was like maybe sometime in the 60s, right? But like ENIAC, the first computer had a typewriter hooked up to it. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah um, and, and yeah, it was very, the, the kind of input you could put into that was pretty limited, but, um, but I had no idea, right, that that first was so early and there were a lot of interesting things like that. So. There's even like pre-computer or pre-computer we're getting into the the fun territory of what's actually a computer but there's right. <laughs> like pre real computer machines that were built at bell that they were using teletypes to 
interface mm-hmm. with remotely. So like, is yeah, that you can typing into a computer? You count Morse code. Yeah, you yeah, can go back. That's a key. You can go back into the 1800s if you really want. <laughs> <laughs> so we've obviously been talking about there's a long history of these text games, graphic lists, interface style games. I mean, you have at least 50 years that you're covering. <laughs> so why do you think that in general, text games are such an enduring, enduring genre. Is it, does the interactive fiction aspect here matter or is it just the, that the interface works on everything? Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you know, I, like I was saying earlier, it's like writing is just such an old human endeavor, right? We've been doing it for so long. And th- we went, we lived through this sort of weird time where because text games were some of the earliest computer games, when the like you know popular style of computer games changed those games started to be seen seen as like old fashioned or retro and for you know 20 years that was kind of the association we had but i think we're sort of circling back to now to like oh okay well this is just text right we were writing this in the 1800s we were writing it in the 1600s right <laughs> like it's been around a, a long practice, time you know yeah yeah um <laughs> so um so i think you're you're seeing a kind of these kind of games reemerge in all kinds of weird places right so like one of the things uh, that I cover is um, sort of mobile romance games, which especially the first generation of for early, earlier phones were mostly text-based. Um, and millions, like tens of millions of people uh, played those games, but they're not really talked about much, right? But there's this interesting statistic where the first game from the company uh, Choices, which makes those games, uh, had more players than um, the Call of Duty game that was the best-selling PC game that year. Um, but it's never talked about in the context of gaming history. Um, and I think it's because people just have such a blind spot about games without graphics, right? Like, uh, the whole games industry is so predicated on wanting to be like interactive movies, right? And you've got game trailers and you've got colorful screenshots. And if you don't have those things, right? Like, how do you make a, a, a preview of a book? If you've ever seen a book preview, you'll know it's a hard, a hard proposition. Um, uh, without that stuff, it's just, um, the, the the mainstream game industry has a hard time wrapping around like how to even engage with this. But, you know, reading and writing are just such um, constant human things. And I think that's where the fascination comes from and why people keep coming back to this medium. You know, it's not dying. It just keeps being reborn in all kinds of different interesting ways. Um, because I think the idea kind of really just keeps independently occurring to people, right? It's like, what if what if you made a book that someone could could change or be part of or, or, you know, affect. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, it's just kind of, you know, 50 years from now, I think people will still be making these kinds of games. They'll probably look very different from what we have now. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's going to be an endless well to draw inspiration from. So going back to the prologue discussion, because I don't know, I always like the weird liminal spaces where stuff hasn't, emerged in a way we can recognize yet we were talking very briefly i guess just mentioning about business games off um prior to the interview Mm -hmm. so what do you think of those you think that those cross the threshold into text-based games yet or is it still a little too primitive yeah so um for folks who don't know this reference i did a, a a post on the blog um about these really early 1950s games that word um, uh, used in business schools uh, to sort of teach basic uh, kind of like business management skills. And my, my, uh, my uh, side theory on this is that um, these were actually invented largely because business colleges had just bought these expensive computers and were trying to desperately find some way to justify why they had spent all this money. That on would them. actually make a lot of sense <laughs> because I've, I've read a lot about them when I've done, whenever I do episodes on text-based games, I'm always like, well, I have to, add caveats about we can't always have first firsts um and that always right. turns into a d- quick discussion on business games but it they've always seemed like an answer that's really looking for a problem really <laughs> right hard. yeah totally but yeah so but the interesting thing about these and yeah that's right because you had re-implemented one of these right for um yeah. for the yeah yeah that's really cool um yeah. Th- so what's interesting about them is their their input and output is mostly numbers, right? Because mm. uh, they would generate these reports, uh, sort of like quarterly report simulations, right? Of like how well the business did, how much money things cost, how many units you moved of this product, whatever, right? And then you would write back mostly in numbers too, right? Because you'd say, well, I want to increase the marketing budget by 5% or I want to 
you know, spend this much money on R and D next month or whatever. And it um, had to be mediated with staff because right. they put them on punch <laughs> cards. Yeah. Yeah. That was a whole interesting thing is nobody outside of a few specialists knew how to operate a computer. So most of these games were designed to have this kind of um, this layer between this human layer between the players and the computer. Um, so some of the early um, war games, which were in design pretty similar to the, the business games, um, had a role called like an umpire which was sort of the person who would like, um, you know, take what the players wanted to do, decide if they were within the rules of the game, feed that into the computer, right? Um, but also kind of like make decisions and adjudicate. Like they might say like, oh, well, you know, I've decided that that's impossible. You can't do that because in real life, you wouldn't be able to do that for reason X, even though yeah, that's not part of the simulation, right? A dungeon master in a suit, Yeah, it's, I guess. it's very similar. Um, but that's that's really interesting because we don't think now of that being a role that you should need right like if you're playing mm -hmm. a game you would just expect the computer's going to handle all the game stuff right <laughs> um but in these in these early programs um i think a computer was still more seen as like an aspect of um an exercise like let's simulate running a business right the computer can crunch some numbers but of course you're still going to need people to do things and it, those games are interesting because a lot of them are almost like live action role-playing games right so the students would get together with their generated quarterly report and they'd have these, you know, mock meetings where they would plan out budgets. The, uh, the one I wrote about, um, the students even had to assemble a board of directors made up of faculty members at the business college and give reports to them. <laughs> That's just so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that the um, Rand game or was that the I think Honeywell? that was the, uh, the Carnegie tech gotcha. uh, one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was like three or four papers. I think they were actually published about these games. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just so interesting. So you would, you would sort of indirectly be using the computer like once a week, but you'd be playing the game the whole week in the middle. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just a really interesting space to me of these sort of like hybrid, you know, you, you, you started by asking if those are really games and it's like, they are, but they're not, they're not quite operating in the way that we think of computer games operating today. And so that's really interesting to me. Just really quickly, the re-implementation I did is it's not very good and it's way over-engineered. <laughs> um, but I was telling my friends about um, the Rand game, which I think is 54 is when that's published off. I remember mm. correctly off somewhere in the annals of my head. <laughs> um, and I was describing this to my friends and they're like, Oh, that just sounds like the worst video game imaginable. That's, <laughs> that's so boring. I'm like, well, maybe it's not. Uh, but so I ended up making this Node.js implementation of it, which, like I was saying, it's it's overkill. It has a database backend for concurrent play online. But nice. some of my friends got together and played it. And it, they're actually, we didn't do the week-long um, style of play where you have right. to plan. We <laughs> sat down and did, did like real-time rounds for an evening. And they're, it's kind of fun when you have like the real-time feedback. I I can't imagine it would be fun, though having to wait around for a report and <laughs> right. go to your fake board of directors. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's so, um, so many of those super early games are lost just because the hardware is so old, right. That porting it to a modern platform is just like out of reach for most people to do. Um, and, and they were so obscure, right. That there wasn't like a, an audience of people wanting to do that. So yeah, a lot of those games are hard to play. So it's really cool to see, you know, people trying to make them run again, <laughs> give them well, a, the, a new life. <laughs> the the other weird thing with old software and old hardware too, I guess, tangentially, is you run into a lot of interface problems, right? Mm, yeah. So like with business games, not everyone happens to have a a punch type machine sitting around in their office, which is a right, crying yeah. shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I love, so like, so like the adventure source code, we were talking about that, yeah. has all this stuff about like, how to restrict the hours people can play because computer time was valuable, right? So there, there are all of these, like if you look at the text strings of that program, there's a ton of them that are just about this kind of like administration and, um, you know, like the, the business of running a not for professional use program <laughs> on a computer, on a mainframe computer in 1976, which again is like a thing we're not used to thinking about anymore as being part of games. So, so I guess on that same topic, a lot of these early games were written explicitly for teletypes. So do you think that that's how much of that DNA stuck around in 
text games, do you think? Or has that just been fully wiped away at this point? Yeah, that's something that I really try to engage with in this series is kind of like the, the the materiality and the physicality of what playing these games was like when they first came out. And that's everything from, you know, like, what's it like to sit at a teletype and play the Oregon Trail in 1971 to, you know, what's it like to play a game for the iPad in 2014, right? Which in 50 years will be as weird to people <laughs> as, <laughs> as thinking about teletypes is now, right? Um that's the stuff that gets lost in emulation, right? So you can sort of like play an emulated version of a game, but where's the like, what's the difference between, you know, being there at that time playing it? Um, and so, yeah, teletypes, you know, obviously predated computers, right? They were this existing technology for transmitting and printing text over distances. Um, and um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things uh, for me that came about that came about from thinking of what it was like to play them. So, so just one example is um, the original organ trail has um, can operate the bell on the teletype, which was used um, for alerts sometimes, but also just for the like end of line carriage return uh, familiar from typewriters. But if you look at um, certain events in that game, like if you're hunting and you successfully shoot um, a deer um, you can see like the, the ASCII code to ring the teletype interspersed um, through the string printing the, the success message um and the teletypes mostly in use at that time printed about 10 characters a second and the the frequency of that is about every 10 characters so you can imagine then what it would have sounded like to hear that you would have heard this bell ringing about once a second and that made me think oh i wonder if when he did that he was trying to emulate the sound of like midway carnival games right when you win you get this like the repeating bell right and again that's the kind of thing that in an emulator you don't necessarily get the exact timing of that the way that would have played out um, another similar thing to that too is, um, so rocket, which was the game that inspired a million kind of lunar lander style games. Um, the original version of that also, um, because of the speed of the teletype, um, you put in your inputs in, uh, of how much you want to adjust the rocket as you're sort of trying to land on the moon in 10 second intervals. And that's again, about how long it would take to, um, for your input to go in and for it to print the next line. So that game is kind of unfolding in real time, even though. Uh, in the modern sense, we're not used to thinking of it playing that way because you you think of a, a line of text as just instantly appearing, right? If you're playing it in an emulator. But at the time, it took time for that to transmit. Um, so yeah, I think some of those aesthetics creeped into how the first generation of game makers thought about what they were doing, right? Um, like the command line is a thing that um, evolved out of early teletype interfaces because um, you had, you know, you got, a report of what happened in your last command or your last program that was be printed out. And then you would type in the next thing you wanted to do and hit return and then wait. And then you would get the next thing to come back. And so that became the interface for the first text games, right? The text adventure, you type a command, which would be what your, your avatar, your player character was going to do next, like go South or get lamp or kill dragon or whatever. Um, and that was just really natural because that's how people um, operated computers uh, as, you know, things switched over to keyboards and stuff, you still had, you know, uh, interfaces like DOS that were command line based. Um, but in later generations who didn't grow up with that kind of interface, um, it seems really baffling, right? And a really common thing for, uh, you know, younger people, especially, but just anyone not familiar with the text adventure is sitting down at this command prompt and just having no idea what to do, right? Like, what, what am I supposed to type here? Help. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the people, you know, when all of those tropes crystallized, it was just everybody knew, you know, at a command prompt, well, there's going to be a list of commands that work and the way to find those out is to read the manual or whatever, right? That like people knew how to figure out how to swim in that environment. But as the hardware and the UI has changed, that's a different, um, it's not the same design language, right? That modern computers are using anymore. So so yeah, I think a lot of that stuff really does deeply affect the assumptions that go into genres and the kinds of um, approaches people make. It's it's so fascinating to me, the blind spots that develop over years, right? Like a game that was perfectly playable in 1985 becomes totally baffling by 2015 because the people trying to play it just have so, so many different assumptions about yeah, how things different are supposed expectations. to work. Yeah, yeah. So one question that I think some people grapple with, I... I come down on the very firm side of this, so I, I think we'll agree on this. But do you think that the history of video games or 
computer games in general, I guess, putting the video part aside, (laughs) do you think that that should be something that's separate from the broader history of computers or should they be told as one bigger unified story? Yeah, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating as I was researching this project is um, just how kind of intertwined uh, the history of these games. And I suspect all video games are with the history of computing, right? Whether it's, you know, there's a new piece of hardware or a new software platform that somebody wants to try out and see what it can do. And then they make a really cool game with it. Um, Whether it's, you know, the limitations of uh, a particular era or particular system causing someone to, you know, be creative to work around them. Um, That kind of creativity from constraint is such a huge thing. Um, Almost every one of these games, I ended up writing about um, the computers they were running on for one reason or another, right? Um, And so if you you read through this series, it's impossible not to learn a ton about the history of uh, computing just because uh, they're kind of so intertwined. Um, So I don't think it's necessarily that they you know, ideologically should or shouldn't be together. It's just they're, they're, they're interrelated at such a fundamental level. Right. Um, and that's, I think a place where this kind of writing is different than, um, novels, right. Uh, or, or other kinds of more traditional forms of writing, because those have had a stable platform for quite a while now. <laughs> they don't really release paper two very often. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, but people making text games are constantly you know trying to figure out like what can i do in this platform how can i get around its limitations uh what what is the next platform going to offer me that no one could do before this um so at least so far right for a half a century now um it's it's been just kind of a fundamental part of the way these games are made and thought about um so so yeah i th- i think um another angle on that too is that um I know like in, in at universities, right? Like computer game classes are sometimes used as kind of like a gateway drug to get students interested in just computer science generally, right? Um, so, so it's definitely like a fun way to, to start, you know, uh, learning this stuff and thinking about this stuff um, at the very least. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's very intertwined. I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about the history of these games without talking about the platforms they ran on. There's also a good well, not a good number. There are a lot of games that have pushed the technical envelope and actually helped with advancing computing. Zork, I know I keep mentioning Zork, but that's that's the code I'm probably most familiar with. Um, the stuff they were doing with their source code for portability is wild. Yeah. Because they they developed a whole language, a bytecode, a virtual machine, and an implementation meta language for a text game that you don't yep. really think of text games as being like insanely sophisticated pieces of software, but a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. And especially in the early years of yeah, home computers, a lot of those games were really pushing the limits of what those computers were capable of doing. Because if you had a system that only had, you know, 12 K of memory or, or, you know, was running on a cassette tape that could only load in, you know, a few thousand characters of, of data and text, um, you had to get really creative and you had to really push that hardware to its limits to figure out how am I going to fit a whole simulation of a cave system or a whole, you know, virtual world uh, in this tiny footprint. Um, uh, And I think that's, you know, it's maybe less visible, but that's continued in a lot of um, more recent games, uh, text games, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a game like Fallen London, uh, you know, really trying to figure out how to make a web-based UI look, um, professional and be easy to read um, in an era when a lot of websites were still pretty ugly, right? Or whether that's, um, you know, uh, games for mobile devices that are really, um, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, get the 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 content they want delivered uh, in a way that's readable. So like uh, Lifeline, the game where you text the astronaut was developed for the Apple Watch, which has, you know, like a tiny screen. So how do you tell a text-based story when you can only fit you know, 25 words on the screen uh, at a time, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of still ongoing uh, in, in a way. So to close out here, I have one last big, not a yes or no question. Um, <laughs> how do you think learning about all this history of text games since you write IF yourself, how do you think learning about the history has impacted you? Is this going to change 
how you approach interactive fiction in the future? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so yeah, like, you know, my background originally was was making these games and writing about them. And then I kind of took a long detour through academia. I guess this, this phase probably started with, you know, <laughs> uh, writing a dissertation um, about interactive stories, which involved a lot of historical research. Um, and then a piece of that got spun off into a book I co-authored on the history of uh, graphic adventure games, uh, which is related to this work, but it's kind of its own thing. Um, and then now this project. So I've been I've been kind of in research and um, uh, history mode for five or six years now. Um, but yeah, I, I do think um, you know once I kind of do get back to making new games, um, it's going to be invaluable because um, you know I think something that's true in any medium is if you uh, if you look outside of the stuff people are doing in that particular medium or that particular subgenre of the medium, it's always enriching because you're just getting a broader perspective. You're pulling in, you know, different ways of seeing things and thinking about things. Um, and I think a lot of people, it's, it's really natural and easy if you start making, you know, visual novels or roguelikes or, or some little genre of games, you're only playing that kind of game. You're only talking to other people making that kind of game. But the more you can kind of broaden your horizons and expand what you're looking at to other domains, I think the more useful that is because your stuff is going to be less like what everyone else is doing. It's going to be um, more original. Um, so for me, you know, having come from writing parser style text adventures, that was the kind of subgenre of this whole field I was most familiar with. Um, but diving into so many weird parts of this history from play by mail games, which were big in the eighties to, um, you know, BBS games, um, uh, hacking simulators. There's just all of these, you know, different ways people have tried to combine uh, text with um, code. Um, and I think when I start going back to think about making new stuff, um, I just have such a big well of inspiration to draw from now, right? Like there, there's, um, there's a game from the 80s called Star Saga 1 that was a kind of space trading strategy game but with this heavy narrative component, but the narrative all existed in this huge printed um, book that came with the game. So it was like a multiplayer game for multiple people, at the same computer. And every now and then the game would tell you like, okay, you need to go read uh, text one, nine, eight, seven. And then that would have like a bit of story or, and, in it. And, and the game was programmed with how all of these bits of story connected and what order they could go in and how they related to what, you know, how much money you had or what planet you were on or everything. But the actual text was in the game, presumably because it couldn't all fit on the the size of discs yeah, that, that were around then. That's so interesting. That's kind of, this is a side tangent, but one of my big areas of research in the foreground, I guess, also in the background is hypertext and mm. alternative modes of hypertext. And that's that's just really sounds like they're trying to get at doing some kind of hypertext implementation with really limited features. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's so cool about all those things and having all those things in my head is like maybe an inspiration for an idea will strike me and I'll be like, Oh, like actually the idea of uh, a bunch of people sitting around a computer, but also reading a book together at the same time, like maybe there's something in there, right? Like maybe that yeah. could provide a basis for some kind of new idea. So, um, I just, I, I love, um, finding sources of inspiration from unusual places like that. And so I think having spent so much time thinking and, and looking into this history, um, it's inevitably going to like spark interesting ideas. And I'm, I'm excited to get to that part. <laughs> well, good. That's, it's always exciting. Well, Aaron, that's all I have for you. So thanks so much for coming on the show. And can you tell my listeners where they can learn more about what you're working on? Yeah. So, so um, this, this blog series, um, like I said, covers these 50 games uh, that's all still online. Um, I'm getting ready to crowdfund a book version of it, which is going to be, um, I think a really cool, um, kind of way to have a keepsake of these uh, ephemeral blog posts. Um, probably the best way to find out about that is to just Google for 50 years of text games uh, and you'll you'll find links to it. Um, but that's going to be crowdfunding this summer. Um, so yeah, check that out if you're interested in the history of, of this kind of game. Sweet. Well, I know I've enjoyed reading through the blog post, so maybe I'll get a book once it comes out. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank you. So thanks so much for coming on. Catch Great around. to be here. Yeah, take care. That's it for right now. So I guess all that's left is to thank you for listening to Admin of Computing. 
I'll be back, like I said, next week with a normal full episode. If you like the show, then you probably know the drill by now. You can share the show with your friends, leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, and I think on Spotify now, too. If you want to be a super fan, then you can support the show through Advent of Computing merch or signing up as a patron on Patreon. Patrons get early access to most episodes, polls for the direction of the show, and some bonus content. You can find links to everything on my website, adventofcomputing.com. If you have any comments or suggestions for a future episode, then go ahead and shoot me a tweet. I always love to talk to listeners. I'm at Advent of Comp on Twitter. And hey, have a great rest of your day.